So subtle brethren is the bondage of Vepachite, but more subtle is the bondage of Mara. He who imagines brethren is bound by um, uh, bound by Mara. He who he who does not imagine is freed yes. from the evil one. I am this is an imagining. This am I. This is an imagining. I shall be. This is an imagining. I shall not be. Embodied shall I be. Formless shall I be. I shall be conscious. Unconscious shall I be. Neither conscious nor unconscious shall I be. The imagining, brethren, is a disease. Imagining is an abacus, a barb. Wherefore, brethren, ye must say, with mind free from imaginings will we abide, thus must train yourselves. I am, brethren, is an agitation. This am I. These, brethren, are agitations. Wherefore, brethren, ye must say, with mind free from agitation will we abide, thus must ye train yourselves. I am, brethren, is in palpitation. This am I. These, brethren, are palpitations. Wherefore, brethren, ye must say, with mind free from palpitations will we abide, thus must ye train yourselves. I am, brethren, is a conceptual proliferation. This am I. These, brethren, are proliferations. Wherefore, brethren, ye must say, with mind free from proliferations will we abide. Thus must ye train yourselves. I am, brethren, is a conceit. This am I. These, brethren, are conceits. Wherefore, brethren, ye must say, with mind free from conceit will we abide. Thus, master, train yourselves. Right. So, we will uh, start from there. So, actually, uh, I hope to share uh, my screen also. So, actually, we were discussing this particular sutta. I am going to share my screen, uh, Saman. Yeah, but that's stop sharing mine. Uh, so, <clears throat> as we see, so there are five... Uh, kind of uh, possibilities that Buddha is trying to explain here. One is uh, we call uh, manjita. Manjita means the uh, imaginations. That's what uh, we already discussed, the manjita, imagination. So I am is an imagination. Asmiti bikkave manjita metam. I am ahang asmiti manjita metam. Actually, we discussed this already, how I am, the personality view, and comes out as an imagining, as a conceiving. And then we discuss about injita, that is where kind of an agitation in the mind can cause the perception of I to come out, the sense of I to come out. So I am is an agitation, I am is a palpitation, perturbation. So this is another aspect explained in the Yavakalapi Sutta, that also we discussed. And then uh, we explain about the pandita, so I am is a palpitation, I am is a kind of a trembling. So when the mind is not settled in a kind of a uh, trembling situation, so it can get into this kind of uh, eye-making, mind-making process. So all that prapancha, all that different kinds of thoughts can initiate as a result of some kind of a restless state of the mind. That's another third possibility that Buddha mentioned. And last actually we discussed about the papanchita, that is actually the theme of this whole book. So all these uh, different kinds of conceivings, all these different kinds of perceptions, all these different kinds of thoughts, so that they, they can arise because of the uh, proliferative tendency available in the mind. So I mean, it's a proliferation. So our mind has that uh, kind of a property where when we when there's a simple thing, it it actually diversifies. It creates it, it diversifies it, it imagines about it, it thinks about it with respect to the past, it thinks about it with respect to the future. So we complicate the whole thing. 
as a result of that the thinking process is going on and on on various directions and so ultimately we get entangled with the whole thing so that is what we last discuss uh, how this uh, mind get confused because of this overthinking so this overthinking is a one in one cause uh, of uh, actually the uh, creating of all these different thoughts so our mind has this inherent kind of a bad quality of uh, diversifying things get into some kind of a multiplying effect inside the mind we are not keeping things as very simple rather when a simple thing happen we diversify it we magnify it and we are putting it to many other directions so that is the uh, that is the kind of a uh, this this quality bad quality uh, the mind has so as a result of that all these different kinds of possibilities are there so i am i am this i am going to do this i am going to do that uh, i am going to be like this i am going to be like that so all that different kinds of i made i centered thinking can happen and today we can discuss the last one ya yeah, buddha mention uh, asmiti bikkave managata meta so this uh, the i making the i the personality view i am some kind of a sense based thinking so all that happens because of a, some sort of a measurement so because of the influence of avijja the ignorance actually we create a person and now we start to compare this person with another person <clears throat> so that is what inherently going to happen so we have this basic avijja the basic uh, kind of ignorance thinking that here there is a person here there is an individual now when such individual individual is available that individual is being compared with other individuals kind of a comparison is initiated so this comparison creates lot of thoughts i am good i am bad he is good he is bad so likewise uh, i am better than him i am worse than him or i am the best so i am not that good how can i go beyond him how can i conquer him so all that different kinds of uh, thoughts can happen because we start comparing now this is a very inherent kind of another quality we have in our mind and it's quite difficult quality to remove or we can say a difficult kind of a defilement to remove and it is necessary to understand understanding it is also difficult because one once uh, conceit happens in the mind we immediately start becoming a slave to that pull to that and we are starting uh, acting according to that say for example if someone is uh, very rich now as a result of that fair amount of conceit can happen in his mind so he simply start acting like a conceited person so it's quite difficult to recognize that conceit and become uh, very you know humble so people are behaving like conceited ignorant people and they think that they are the superiors and others are all inferior so they create this kind of a compli- uh, kind of a complication in their mind so because of this measurement so that ultimately actually not really ultimately that actually compelled the person to think i am here i am good i am better i am the best i did it properly i did it best than him so likewise we compare ourselves with other individuals other human beings with other situations and uh, we create lot of thinking our mind is consumed by various thoughts because of this uh, conceit so how what are the possibilities available for this conceit to happen say race is one possibility now when we are thinking our race is the best race that means our nationality is the best nationality we tend to think okay i am the best i am coming from uh, say we, most of us are here say singhalese so we can think okay singhalese nation is the best nation so we are the most traditional or we are the most authentic kind of people so we can keep ourselves very high and we can look down the others and we can create lot of uh, say suffering and create lot of conceit in our mind and if the others are not respecting if they are ignoring or if they are neglecting then we even suffer 
So this nationality or the race is one possibility that people are using to create conceit. On the other hand, various clans are there. I mean, different uh, groups are there, different caste systems are there among the people. So if one is in a high caste, then he start uh, becoming more conceited and looking down the other people who are consider them as the lower caste. The conceit can happen. If one is uh, quite healthy and the others are not that healthy, and as a result of even this health of one's body, that also can become somewhat uh, a reason to be kind of conceited. Say you are the ones uh, uh, helping others, you are the ones looking after the others, you are the ones treating others, you are the ones giving medicine to the others. So you are the doctor, you are the nurse, but others are helpless, they are poor, they are always sick. So you are the ones always giving a solution. So you can have a lot of conceit because you are so healthy and you are taking care of your body and it's fairly healthy at the moment. So you can become conceited because you are your body is quite healthy. That is another reason. And when we are young, our bodies are quite beautiful or strong and pretty. And uh, naturally, we feel conceited because, say, others are maybe pretty old and they are they look ugly. And uh, likewise, we start comparing our body with the others, our strength with the others. So that also can cause conceit to happen in our mind. And sometimes we uh, all come across a lot of gains, a lot of fame, and we start receiving various gifts, various prizes, various awards, and uh, others start respecting us. So that also a cause of uh, conceit. Now you know that sometimes people become quite learned and they have several degrees and that is another cause of being conceited. So they think, okay, I'm the one knowing everything. I'm the best. I'm the expert. So others are quite ignorant people. They are sort of inferior to me. I'm the one knowing things. I'm the best. My idea is the best. So likewise, we start creating a conceited mindset looking down the others and putting ourselves up. On the other hand, we can create the other side. Say if we don't have any kind of our education, if we are uh, not having good learnedness, but others are quite learned and uh, they are uh, quite educated and we can even compare ourselves with the other person and we can think, okay, I'm not that educated, I'm quite uh, timid or I'm foolish, I'm ignorant, uh, so likewise, we can even compare ourselves, keeping ourselves into the lower level and still uh, have a lot of suffering. And all that conceit can cause further thinking. And probably when we have a lot of followers or companions, so that also can become a cause of conceit, thinking that, okay, I have many followers, my teachings are the say, best teachings, many have accepted these teachings, they are venerating this teaching. They are telling that these are quite sublime, unique kind of teachings. So I am the one who preached. I am the one taught. So then I am is created. A person is created. A conceited person is created. So you can see even the teaching sometimes if you are ignorantly using, if you are trying to claim it, thinking that I am the one knowing the teaching or I am the one uh, kind of possessing the teaching, it can even create kind of suffering in oneself. And it can create a lot of uh, conceit in oneself. And say sometimes we are wealthy. Others not. Others are not that wealthy. So this wealth is another cause uh, that can create conceit. And sometimes we are beautiful. Others are not that beautiful. That can, that kind of, a, say, the body, body, the complexion, the beauty also can become another reason for someone to become conceited. And sometimes we have a lot of skills. Say you are quite good in playing a guitar, you are quite good in music, so you are quite good in sports, okay, you are quite good in your education, or you are quite good in hiking, maybe you are good in cricket, whatever it is. So different kinds of skills different human beings actually possess. So that particular skill can be used to prepare a self, create a self, start thinking, looking down the others and uh, sort of uh, exaggerating oneself. So that is another area that we compare ourselves, various skills that we have. So either keeping my skills 
either thinking that my skills are the best skills or on the other hand either thinking i don't have skills so others are quite skillful i am just a beginner or i am i don't know much so still i am creating a self because of the conceit because of this comparison and sometimes we have a lot of experience and we count experience we appreciate our experience and that is what matters uh, when we are going to a new job so they they recognize that expertise and that also can become a reason for become conceited say in a in a particular office suppose that you are the uh, expert in a particular area so people are coming to you they are asking various questions and you are giving some brilliant answers and they appreciate your presence so you become someone you become a person you become someone very quite special and very essential person to that crowd essential people to your office without you the whole thing cannot manage so you feel considered you feel quite uh, a vip and uh, so that is another area that we can create conceit so basically our skills we have we need to manage properly recognize them carefully and how to use our skills to minimize defects rather than to promote defects i mean skills are necessary actually then only we can use these skills to uh, have a maintain a family or to continue our life span because we need certain amount of skills but are we using our skills to become conceited to look down the others so this skills are another area where we can become fairly conceited and sometimes there are certain spiritual practices even some austere practices say a particular monk he is only eating the arms round food pindapathika and the other monks are simply eating at the monastery that they are not going videsh pindapatha but uh, there is a certain monk he is going for videsh pindapatha he never eats at the of, at the monastery so this particular person can become little conceited so okay, i am the one adhering to dutang i am the one adhering to various this kind of difficult austere practices others are quite lazy fellows that they don't know they don't aspire or they don't uh, practice diligently i am the one practicing diligently so likewise one can become conceited so even the dutang even the austere practices if you are not properly handling it can even create a lot of uh, conceit in oneself because you are you are keeping yourself very up if you are following them if you are appreciating what you are doing and you are creating a self out of that and without knowing properly to handle it handle it so ultimately even these uh, spiritual endeavors can become a kind of a hindrance and some other things even our morality even our concentration skills psychic powers all that can become a reason to become conceited say you are maintaining very good seela others don't have seela others are ignorant about their seela others are careless about seela but you are so concerned about the seela and you haven't broken haven't broken any kind of a precept for a long time so you become quite confident and but others you see that they are lapse in there are various lapses in their seela their morality and you start feeling conceited because you are protecting the seela for the best of your ability and others are quite uh slack in that and they don't they are not maintaining that uh, strongly so you can become conceited so even these spiritual qualities sometimes if you are not properly handling them it can cause conceit so basically uh, there are various questions related to this sometimes uh, with the highlighted so how to overcome conceit so one interesting uh, advice given to venerable rahula animittanch bhavehi mana anusaye mujjah tato mana bhi samaya upasanto charissasi ti so one very interesting area to recognize conceit is the animitta state where you are able to develop fair amount of mindfulness fair amount of wisdom and when that wisdom has uh, temporarily stopped all the different kinds of signs taking of signs inside so as a result of that you are maintaining a very clear mind fairly cleansed mind very a huge a proper clarity is there very sharp clarity is there in your mind so as a result of that now you can recognize conceit 
because recognizing conceit is not that easy. You need a fair amount of clarity of the mind and again you need a fair amount of wisdom in order to recognize the operation of the conceit. So Animitta state of mind is a very rich ground, a fairly potential ground for you to recognize the conceit. So therefore Buddha recommends that to Venerable Rahula. Animittanja bhavehi mananuse mujja. So Buddha encouraged Venerable Rahula to develop the signless concentration to maintain the mind signless as much as possible without getting entangled with name and form, Nama Rupa. Rather, you create your mind fairly crystal clear as much as possible on such situation when there is a subtle defilement, when there is a little conceit arising in one's mind, you can easily trace that, you can recognize that. You are wisely recognizing that and without being fooled by that, you are simply uh, dropping it. You are simply letting it go. So now you are overcoming slowly, slowly the conceit. So that is one area. And various other techniques are described in order to overcome uh, conceit. Say for example, the Anicca Sanya Sutta explained about the importance of the impermanence, understanding the impermanence and uh, uh, sort of uh, proper maintenance of one's uh, mind grounded in imp impermanence. So you can simply look at phenomena and you can recognize how impermanent they are. Katam bhavita cha bhikkave anicca sanya katam bahuli kata sabbang kamaragam pariyadiyanti sabbang asmimanam pariyadiyanti samuhanti. So likewise Buddha explained. So how these different uh, subtle defilements including the conceit can be abandoned. So they are actually Buddha mentioned how one see the impermanent nature of the five aggregates. With respect to form aggregate, how it is uh, arising and how it is passing away. So they are able to explain now, okay, so these are the different uh, phenomena, element characteristics available and you, you, you know them thoroughly now, you know exactly, you have experienced them, but now you see how they are coming and going, appearing and disappearing, how inconstant they are. So that causes this uh, conceit defilement to slowly, slowly fade away, to become weaker. So the practice of impermanence, understanding impermanence, in that sense is a very good uh, opportunity for us to abandon conceit. And further, at certain other suttas, actually Buddha explain uh, some similar thing, where how, how one is creating a self. With respect to Rupa, sometimes people create a self. So instead of creating a self, they are Buddha mention, okay, you you little uh, influence the mind. Okay, there is no person here. There is no being here. So so here Buddha encourages one one to uh, uh, do that. So you are little emphasizing that there is no being here. There is no uh, soul here. There is no person here. There is nothing belong to a soul here. So likewise, you are completely little uh, empowering the mind with this impermanence, with this uh, non-self. So as a result of that, you are not creating a self. You are not creating a conceit. Because when you create an individual, a self-view that promotes conceit, because you start being a strong person, a valid person, a very special person, and you tempt to uh, compare yourself with others because of this produced personality. But now, once you understand that it's a simple illusion and no point of uh, attach to that, and as a result of that, what happens is, so you become sort of a very humble person and you understand because of the ignorance this conceit happened and slowly you start abandoning that conceit, eye-making and mind-making, so that uh, this uh, conceit starts fading away. So likewise, Buddha explained in this Anicca Sanya Sutta how important this uh, practice of impermanence, understanding how impermanent things are. So that is what ultimately leads you to the signless concentration where our mind starts uh, not taking any kind of uh, sign, not registering any sign, keeping the mind very clear without any kind of uh, entanglement, any confusion, so this animitta is a very rich area for one to recognize these subtle defilements. 
So these are the areas actually I want to highlight today with respect to Yavakalapi Sutta. And actually we can conclude today's uh, Yavakalapi Sutta also. We have spent fair amount of time on to this topic because uh, Katukrana Thero has highlighted its potential Yavakalapi Sutta in his book. And it's a very, very interesting book. I mean, the Yavakalapi Sutta is a very, very interesting sermon. We will really vividly explain how we are creating various thoughts and uh, and Buddha's advice. Okay, now monks, you've got to keep your mind free from uh, manjita, free from any kind of a conceit. So try to maintain a mind free from conceit. So that's the advice of the Buddha. Because this uh, managata, so conceit is a roga, is a kind of a disease. It's a kind of a kind of a il, a illness. So now try to overcome that. So keep the mind quite relaxed without comparing, without making a self, without making an individual. And if if you even create it, don't promote it. Don't get entangled in it. So don't encourage it. So simply drop it. Understand that this is a, a ignorant made sankhara. This is a formation created by the ignorance, created by the craving. So because of craving that we have created a sankhara, a kind of a mental formation, thinking, okay, I am good, I am bad, or I am, I am the best, I am better than him. So all that are different kinds of thoughts which happens because of certain amount of ignorance. And once you recognize it, now you've got to drop it rather than promoting it. So this is what I like to share with you today. And we will we'll continue our uh, discussion with the concept and reality book from next, next, next week. Actually, with today's discussion, we can conclude the Yavakala episode part available in that book. And then we can uh, start uh, proceeding next week. Okay, with that, I am uh, winding up the Dhamma sermon the book discussion and now I like to open the session for questions. Yeah, okay. Uh, Hiranti, you can uh, maybe you can ask me a question. Yeah. yeah. Pante, you mentioned about those three things the recognize the conceit by na animitta we are mm-hmm. taking Nama Rupa. Are you saying we shouldn't be doing uh, recognizing it initially, uh, thinking that there is an armor, there is a rupa, and there is no self. Is that the way, or could you kindly describe it a bit further, please? Yeah, actually, uh, I mean, if you can recognize how I is created, a person is created at any level, that is welcome. No need to, uh, you know, postpone it. If you can immediately understand, okay, there is an I made kind of a, a personality is being created, a personality is being uh, promoted at any level. So that we need to be aware and drop it rather than promote it. Say, for example, you are practicing Kayanupasana. Uh, typically, we give some uh, prominence to the body. And while we are going through that practice, probably we probably may understand how we are using the body to create uh, conceit. Actually, the we are using the body now to develop a certain amount of mindfulness, wisdom. And there are sometimes we understand, okay, sometimes I'm using this body to create a self. I identify with this uh, body. I'm telling this body as myself. So once you know that, once you know that uh, thought happening in your mind, once you know that mental formation happening in your mind, so this advice is to see that See it as a sankhara. See it as a conditioned phenomena. It is based on the ignorance. It is based on the craving. And once you know that, you may start uh, uh, sort of uh, letting it go rather than promoting it, rather than uh, sort of, you know, appreciating it. So you simply understand it's a it's a simple, uh, ignorantly made thought formation. So at whatever level, if you can recognize this thought formation's which are based on ignorance and craving, then it's a matter of dropping them. We, do, we don't need to, uh, you know, the, postpone that task. You can immediately start that if, if it is possible. Isn't the first jnana is separating into nama and rupa? What is, you see, when you do that, aren't you right. doing that itself? 
Yeah, sure. That's why I mean, uh, Nama and Rupa. So once you sort of uh, delimit it. Now, pre- previously we had a person thinking that okay, this body is myself, and I am the one thinking, I am the one knowing. So this kind of a wrong, ignorant uh, kind of a view is with us. But now, as we continue our vipassana practice, at one level we may understand okay, there are various bodily phenomena, various physical characteristics, and they they behave like this. And now this behavior is recognized using various mental phenomena. So apart from mental phenomena and the bodily phenomena, the physical phenomena, there is no person, there is no being. So that is another level of understanding. So that that can that can cause the non-self, the anatta sanya, to arise. No harm, no problem. That that's, that that can be encouraged. But I mean, uh, further and further, as you practice, further and further, all these vipassana practice can promote that can. Uh, sort of further second that uh, understanding, further empower that understanding, further strengthen that understanding. So that is why the whole Vipassana is further and further thoroughly understanding all these realities. So as you said, at its early stages, stages it may be because of this Nama Rupa Parichet. Okay, then as you go along, you just simply yeah. drop it. There is no even Nama Rupa, there is no self. Is that right, Bhante? Uh, actually, there is no Nama Rupa rather than telling there is no Nama Rupa. We can see how Nama Rupa are arising and passing away due to various no. causes and conditions, various name and form are arising and passing away, various forms, various, uh, say, matter, material, material parts or particles, they are arising and passing away. Material characteristics, element characteristics, they are arising and passing away. Arising and yeah, various feelings arising and passing away. So if we simply say that they don't exist, so then we come to another extreme, rather telling like that. So we are we are going to a middle understanding. So so if we if we completely deny their existence, then we are coming to one extreme. If we simply say they exist for a long time or uh, eternally, so then we come to another extreme. So without getting to any of these extremes, so we can understand, okay, they are simply arising and passing away. They are continuously changing. Okay, I got it. Ante, thank you. Teruan Sarnai. Yeah, Teruan Sarnai. Oh, Sarnai, Mante, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Please go ahead. Yes. So um, we have uh, six questions today. Right. Um, Question number one of six is on mindful sitting. Dear Venerable Bhante, in our normal life, always, all the time, our body has a shape and some sort of solid form. But during meditation, sometimes I felt like a very, a very big balloon just floating in the air and come back to the body shape later. And some days I experience as a very tall plastic pipe shape. And within (laughs) 5 to 10 minutes, I come back to the normal shape. My question is, during meditation, is this a mental status? And it shows that even though I have a solid form in normal life, actually there is no form. Temporary to go to the Nama status. Much merits for your explanation for us to go to the Dhamma part. Good, good. So basically, you are changing your shape now. <clears throat> <laughs> so you are going through various uh, different shapes, different different shapes, different forms. Ultimately, it will whole thing will disintegrate. So in the anyone's meditation, so uh, I mean there may be a very strong uh, experience where the whole this uh, say um, compact view. You know that we consider our body as one one unique compact body. So this unique compact body can disintegrate, can fall into pieces and they fall apart. And uh, so that that becomes some, sometimes uh, one strong insight that people are experiencing in this uh, animal's meditation. So you, you can simply welcome that and simply go ahead with your practice. And uh, so th- these different bodily shapes, how you perceive can change. And even this can further change. 
so don't worry about these different uh, shapes they are not permanent ultimately all the whole compactness of the body can disintegrate question number 2 of 6 this is a general question dear venerable sir can you please explain briefly about yugananda bhavana yeah yugananda question yugananda bhavana means that uh, you are keeping samatha and vipassana very much uh, in line <clears throat> say there are other two categories samatha pubbanga vipassana the other one is vipassana pubbanga samatha we are uh, you first practice samatha to a fairly high level and then uh, start practicing vipassana that is samatha pubbanga vipassana and you are trying to practice vipassana as much as possible without giving much emphasis to samatha and maybe later time you start practicing samatha so that is uh, vipassana pubbanga samatha in the yugananda bhavana there are you are Uh, trying to keep fair amount of attention to all the different uh, say indriya the faculties you are maintaining fair amount of mindfulness keeping the mindfulness in front and uh, being aware of fair amount of concentration available and fair amount of wisdom being available and trying to balance the whole thing and sometimes i like to promote that because sometimes when you are going only with the samatha practice only with the concentration oriented practice there are certain uh, a hindrances certain shortcomings on the other hand if we are not paying enough at- attention to the tranquility of the mind and that even can cause a lot of agitation in the mind so therefore maintaining kind of a balance and giving some prominence to both sides so you are keeping fair amount of tranquility in the mind at the same time you are giving some emphasis on the vipassana the, the development of the wisdom that would be better so that would be the uh samatha sorry the yuganadda approach question number 3 of 6 this is mindful sitting dear bante i participated in december retreats and much merits for your guidance and training beforehand during the retreat i had the opportunity to practice multiple times a day and to get reflections reviewed my sitting practice was observing the breath and i have experienced that after the breath fades away the focus always comes to the sitting posture and subtle movements of it also time to time i automatically get focused on sounds and sounds of silence and sometimes to thoughts coming and going i recall bante mentioning about secondary objects and keeping equal attention and focus on any one which is coming to the front appreciate if you can elaborate more about these secondary objects and how we should treat them and their role in our practice with metta that's the end of the question yeah but uh, not at the beginning so at the beginning better we give more prominence to the primary object <clears throat> so typically the beginner has to be promoted to associate the primary object as much as possible and using which you are developing fair amount of mindfulness and concentration and later you your mindfulness expands and so you are you start uh, being capable of uh, recognizing even the secondary objects and they now become not a huge distraction previously secondary objects can become kind of a distraction but now uh, not that so at that level actually you can look at any phenomena so your 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 field of uh, awareness become broader and your practice can be uh, fairly broader and you can continue like that question number 4 of 6 is a general question dear venerable bhante satra satipatthana meditation method the way we have been taught mainly focusing on vipassana and never focusing on samadhi without having samadhi what would be the method to achieve samma samadhi then towards sotapan much merits that's the end of the question uh, actually i can't uh, fully accept the question as it is uh, basically uh, in satipatthana we have certain amount of samadhi as well so we can't say that we don't have samadhi at all uh, so basically satipatthana practice takes you to a certain amount of samadhi which is uh, capable of looking at various phenomena in a more subtle precise way so that you start understanding their true nature <laughs> so one thing is that what is samma samadhi so that is actually we discuss sometimes back what is samma samadhi in certain suttas you can refer 
uh, one of the discussions that we conducted based on uh, Professor Analio's uh, one of the research papers. So what is uh, the different kinds of jhana and uh, uh, how they are appearing and how they come into being as the Samma Samadhi and they become overemphasized and how certain wrong interpretations have given. So probably that is another area that you can look at. Probably I will share that uh, with you that uh, uh, the Sutta teaching se section, I have discussed this. Uh, you can refer Sutta teachings. Uh, I will I'll put the link and you can look at that. Uh, so the point is actually Samma Samadhi has different uh, ideas. If you refer uh, Maha Chattali Sika Sutta, so there Buddha defined Samma Samadhi based upon the proper balancing of the path factors. So when Samadhi, Samma Sankapta, Vacha, Kammanta, Ajiva, Vayama, Sati, so all these are in proper collaboration, in proper equipoise, and that is the state of Samma Samadhi. So that is the most preferred uh, definition I would like to uh, take up because there's a fair amount of balances there in the mind. Uh, so I like to take that as the important uh, aspect of Samma Samadhi, where all the path factors are well balanced, all the faculties are well balanced, and not only the Samadhi become more prominent, like in a Jahana. In a Jahana, the point is that uh, uh, the, the concentration become more prominent, more than the other factors. But in the Samma Samadhi, as explained in the Mahachattalis Maha Sutta, so there Buddha explained the Samma Samadhi as the proper balance, equipoise of all the path factors. Then we have achieved the Samma Samadhi. And then the other thing is, uh, sometimes uh, certain, uh, say, jhanas have become too much overemphasized with time. So during the Buddha's time, so they they being treated with fair attention, but not overemphasized. A fair attention was given to vipassana, so to overcome various defilements. But with time, actually, the deeper concentrations have become more prominent and they become more uh, cause of attention. And ultimately, in certain suttas, so they being they have become the definition of the Samma Samadhi. So that sometimes actually Venerable Analyo, he, he basically argues that can become a deviation from the original teachings of the Buddha. So these are certain areas that we need to sort of uh, carefully understand. So therefore, uh, taking Jahana as the Samma Samadhi is not the uh, main teaching that we have to depend on. And I will share the link uh, with you in this uh, uh, in the chat so that you all can uh, listen to that uh, where we were discussing in the uh, Sutta teaching session, which is conducted in every every Wednesday at seven a.m. at Sri Lanka time. So, if you like, you can join with it. Otherwise, you can listen to the recordings available in the internet. And these are two. Uh, sermons, discussions that we use, we did in that session and I have put the links into the chat. Thank you, Bhante, for that. Um, yeah. Question number five of six. <clears throat> now, this is a Dhamma sermon question. Dear Bhante, our skills and experience as a cause of conceit as explained today, even if we don't go to the extremes of judging others compared to our expertise and skills in the office environment, I feel like I am pretty much conceited due to my position and seniority in the team. I feel like little elated and higher than others when I speak as a senior manager in the team and telling others what to do. It is very subtle, but I know it is there. Much merits for your insights with Metta. That's the end of the question. Yeah, uh, thank you. Actually, this is a very, uh, you know, subtle area that we all can go through. Say you become even a monk. Say now I being a little senior monk and I can feel conceited when uh, some followers are there, some say others are paying respect and other junior monks are respecting me. So I can, the conceit can arise. 
so we need to understand that so it is not that we ignore the role we 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 neglect the role and we stop playing the role but we need to play the role at the same time we need to understand if there is any kind of a conceit going to happen going to arise when you are playing the role say for example you are a senior person you are a senior manager and you are, you need to play the role so while playing the role is there any conceit arising say you recognize it and don't be sort of uh, fooled by that or you don't become ignorant by that uh, driven by that so simply recognize that and don't uh, simply abandon that so you become uh, you know uh, grounded rather than uh, completely assumed by that so sometimes what happens is we are quite ignorant about it and we simply start uh, behaving like fools of completely uh, conceited with that uh, different views but uh, when we know that there is a possibility of arising conceit and we become quite quite proud and looking down the others so that is the area that we need to properly recognize and to avoid that question number 6 of 6 this is again a dhamma saman question dear sir as i try to practice mindfulness regularly regularly immediately when my mind drifts to some sort of conceits around me i could recognize and manage not to go behind behind that is that the way we could overcome gradually mind inherited conceit that's the end of the question yeah definitely i mean this is what we are further expanding and uh, this possibility to recognize these kind of conceit uh, inherent in our various thoughts included in our various thoughts become more evident as we continue our practice at the beginning it could be some sometimes difficult and uh, without much of our attention we can easily become conceited later only we understood that but with the practice we start uh, recognizing the possibility of uh, arising conceit more clearly as we are continuing our practice so that's why you can refer that uh, that advice to venerable rahula animittancha bhavehi mananuse mujja so they are buddha's advice is okay now you develop a fair amount of animitta where the mind is quite clean very clear there are no signs so you can uh, easily recognize when the conceit arises in such a mind so we need to have fair amount of a clarity in the mind in order to recognize these kind of subtle defilements so with time you are you are being further developed to recognize the con- conceit arising in your mind we just got two more questions uh, so this is question number 7 of 8 it's a general question venerable sir what is the meaning of naya vipassana yeah so typically naya vipassana means that now say for example you are developing vipassana with respect to yourself say you are analyzing your body so i am using the term you are just to explain the thing so you are using your own body to recognize various phenomena you are using various thoughts you use various perceptions various feelings all are very much like uh, ajat all are very much like internal phenomena your phenomena belongs to your body you know so your mind but the understanding is not limited to that say the developed developed understanding the developed insights that we have gained are now capable of even putting to the others others bodies others minds or other situations now you are expanding your understanding so the naya vipassana is where you are using the developed insights to understand all other external phenomena as well maybe some external inanimate things or animate things you are trying to understand through the developed insights so you have developed certainly these insights using the five aggregates what is very much belong to you ultimately you understand they also not belong to you so they are basically non self and you are using this understanding to the others as well now now everything become uh, very much clear and it's very much like uh, inferential knowledge we are talking anumana jnana inferentially we can understand okay this is this is the common situation to everywhere say you understood your body is uh, created with a lot of uh, element characteristics so every uh, all the physical phenomena are like that so the internal and external uh, distinction become uh, invalid question number 8 of 
is uh, uh, the question. Bante, what is the meaning of animitta state? That is the end yeah, of the question. Is, yeah, yeah. So that is the state that uh, say when you develop particularly the impermanence, anicca sanya. So you start uh, recognizing, say for example, you are recognizing various thoughts, how they are coming and going, how impermanent they are, how subtle they are, how quick they are, how inconstant they are. So as a result of that, you develop a fair amount of uh, wisdom of the impermanence. And when impermanence beings fairly developed, so these thoughts come and going, coming and going, you can't even understand what is the category of thought, whether it is a whether it is an angry thought or whether it is a lustful thought, whether it is kind of uh, any other category of thought, you can't understand because they are so quick. You can't take a nimitta, you can't take a sign of that uh, thought. Say you are using various feelings and then you are, can't understand whether it is happiness or whether it is uh, pain or whether it is equanimity. You can't even understand that because they are very fleeting, completely inconstant, very transient. So that is the position situation we are as we are continuing so the possibility to capture signs marks become less and less ultimately mind drops everything and ultimately since mind has dropped everything so it become liberated it can become completely uh, detached from every phenomena now we call signless state and as we continue that for a long time then we achieve kind of uh, signless concentration, animita samadhi. Where now the mind is not taking any signs at all. Say so you may see, see things, but uh, no sign being taken in. You may hear things, but no sign being taken in. And uh, likewise, you may go through certain experiences, but the mind does not capture any sign. So mind remains uh, clear without any sort of sign and the mind's clarity is intact. Mind clarity is maintained for for some time. So at that moment we can say, okay, you are you are maintaining mind in the signless concentration. Yeah. That is the uh, end of the written questions. So I think uh, we will end the program for today. Samantha has to. Uh, there's the uh, retreat going on at Nisanamania. So to end the program, I would first like to thank Bante for his valuable time, even with the busy schedule at the monastery. To all the supporters of this program, both seen and unseen, and to the participants for joining today to practice and share their questions. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Teruan Sarnai signs. Yeah, Teruan Sarnai. Yeah,